This is a side of the GAA that the association can't seem to get under control. I've been in sports journalism for 36 years and I think I was writing about it in my very first year. This thing, it flares up all, uh, from time to time. It's there in the background. He's back there to help them. It's now 16 years since one of the most notorious flare-ups of violence on one of the GAA's biggest days. My goodness. Oh, it really is ridiculous. The 1996 All-Ireland final clash between Mayo and Meath. I can remember that day quite clearly, you know, and my two lensmen came in and my two umpires and I basically said, boys, I don't care if this takes me five minutes, ten minutes to sort this out. It definitely is not not a nice experience. But uh, I've got to say, out of it all, um, I, I became a different person. I became a much uh, uh, stronger person as a result of what had happened. More recently, when tension spilled over in the wake of the controversial conclusion of the 2010 Leinster final, Louth manager Peter Fitzpatrick was close to the action. The referee just wanted to head towards the dressing room and he just told everybody to get away. And I just walked in along with the, with the, with the referee and everything else. But, and right, granted, a few people made a charge and everything else, but the most important thing was the referee, the, the guards were there, the security in Cole Park I thought was very, very good and everything else. The referee, in good faith, made his call. Nobody wants to see extreme levels of violence on the field. The reality of it is that as long as people play contact sports there will be, uh, in which there is aggression used, that there will be trouble on the field. The issue for the GEA is how it legislates for that trouble. There is times that things do boil over and in the heat of battle and all that. And you'll always have that. And, and you know, to be honest with you, it'd be a bit pity to take that out of it. You know, you need that. Um, I wouldn't like our games to become too nice. You need that aggression and it's a physical game, you know, and, and it's important that we don't, that we don't lose that. But from over the years, from my start of refereeing, and the level of discipline at national level is, has improved an, a lot. Um, I think at pro a provincial level, we, we still have a few issues maybe around the level of discipline, particularly with club championships, uh, um, you know, where you have the, the local parish and it's very parochial stuff. But some of those involved at the highest level believe that the modern game has become too aggressive. Well, I think the, the game has got very, very physical, and uh, I think it's come to the stage now you, you want to have eyes in the back of your head. Maybe the Australian Rail football have a point there at the moment. Do you, do you need two referees or whatever it is? Like? Well, I'd love, you know, if we could aspire to the, to the standard of respect that the rugby referee achieves, uh, um, would be, it'd be where I would want to go as a person. Um, but uh, that's a challenge. There is also the issue of the ambivalent attitude of many GAA officers when faced with players' suspensions. If they think they'll get them off to play in the All-Ireland semi-final or final or quarter-final, they will do it. And while that culture prevails, you can, you can understand why it, it, it peters, or filters on all the way down the line then. The GAA's website states that it is a volunteer-led, community-based organisation that is celebrated as one of the great amateur sporting associations in the world today. It is this amateur status that is now under threat. GAA Director General Porig Duffy has decided to grasp this nettle. He has circulated a discussion paper which sets out three possible courses of action. Do nothing, implement fully the association's rules on its amateur status, or introduce a system of regulated payments to senior inter-county managers. This is something which the GEA has confronted in some shape or form throughout its own history all the time, mostly by operating a kind of pragmatic amateurism whereby a certain amount of money has been allowed to filter through the association to all its levels. Some of that money has been filtering into the hands of managers. Like players, managers are entitled to modest vouched expenses. But it's an open secret that a significant number of managers have been pocketing considerably more than that. I know, and you know, and everybody knows at the moment, there, there is managers out there getting illegal payments, and that has to stop there and everything else, because at the end of the day, that will definitely destroy the GEA, because GEA was always a voluntary organisation, and what's going to happen with people and everything else at the moment, if, if so, so many people in the club are getting paid, and so, so many people in the club are not getting paid, it's going to cause a lot of friction. My, my opinion at the moment is, again, I'm lucky enough, I have a full-time job. And I'm lucky enough that the job I have managing the live team, I love it. If I travel 20 miles to a training venue, I get 50 cents a mile, which is 10 euros. And, you know, and, and to be honest, I'm very, very happy that day at the moment. But it's at club level that this issue is causing the greatest difficulties. Of the 2,500 clubs in the country, it's estimated that over half of them are currently paying their managers. This is driving on itself all the time, driven by success, driven by the need for success or the apparent pursuit of success. And there seems, to be no, there seems to be no stopping this, this, this juggernaut and ultimately you wonder is it going to run through the amateur wall and just flatten it to the ground.
It's a frosty February evening, but the plunging temperature hasn't affected the turnout for Wednesday night training at St. Lazarian's Club in Abbey Leaks. Like many clubs around the country, staying afloat financially is an ongoing struggle. We're kind of a small club in a big town. Um, we field three adult hurling teams. Now, in terms of cost to keep the club going on an annual basis, you're looking at roughly between 30 and 35,000 a year. Um, that's all expenses. That's everything from jerseys to hurling balls to physios to electricity to gas, everything. Two years ago, the club needed a new manager. The new chairman quickly realised that this was going to be a considerable extra expense. They were looking for a manager and we started to ring, ring well-known names from the county and outside the county. The quotes you'd be given would Anthony be from 40, 50 euros up to 100, maybe 150 euros. That's what you'd be looking at. Per session? Per session, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that could be up to five, 600 euro a week? Could be, yeah. It, it could be, yeah. yeah. And are people paying that kind of money in, in, in the club circuit? Well, the kind of the way it is, some clubs can have to pay it. If, if, if they need managers and they don't have the expertise within the club, then yes, they probably will be paying that kind of money. OK, the balls are coming from here. Yeah, yeah. St. Lazarians eventually sourced a manager from within its own ranks who does the job for free. The boost to the club was more than simply financial. The club is financially better off, you like. We don't have the strains of finances behind us and that. We'll invest in our facilities. The main thing is the players are happy. They have a lad training there now that some of them have grown up with them, seen him hurling and that, and um, the boys are responding well. The, the players know, the supporters know, everyone knows that everyone is in it for the right reasons. It is a volunteer ethic which has sustained the GEA for over 125 years. It is at the core of the organisation. And more than that, the structure of the GEA depends upon its amateurism. Clubs, counties, everything working together as one organisation. The minute you move towards professionalism, you're uh, in players and managers, you're one step further towards sundering the association. We need to get our head out of the sand here, uh, come up with a proposal and sort the issue out. You know, probably the ideal scenario is that a manager or a person would offer himself as a service. In other words, he would form a company, provide a management service for a year, he would issue his invoice, look after all his own, own business. And if you take it like, you know, every team has a doctor, county team has a doctor, they have physios, they have all professional people that have to be paid anyway. So, listen, why not pay the manager? When you pay a physio and a doctor, like th these are professional people that's coming out, that, that, that's, the, that's the, the nine to five job as such, I mean like, and there's, there's no problem paying the likes out there because they're paying their stamps, they're paying their PSI and they're paying everything, and th that's their living. Like to me, the two people that should be getting paid are getting paid, but everybody else should be doing it on a voluntary basis or just taking the mileage. The decision by a number of high profile players to withdraw or step back from the inter-county game has highlighted the extreme commitment the modern game demands from players. The Gaelic Players Association declined to take part in this programme. It has said that it would support payments to managers and would not seek payments for players should that happen. We're led to believe that the players uh, wouldn't look for it at the moment, but who's, who's to say in five, ten years' time? And once it's another brick gone off the amateur wall, you now have the managers are being paid. Why the managers and not the players? So how long could you, could you hold the line on that one? And that is the great difficulty for the GAA. But with many county boards and clubs drowning in debt from ill-advised projects undertaken in the boom years, the money may simply not be there to pay managers' salaries. Most county boards are struggling. I mean, if you see the annual accounts, there are huge debts out there. They have, a lot of them have cut their costs to some degree, but it's still huge. It's very difficult nowadays to uh, earn the same amount of money. Gates would naturally be down for club, uh, club games would be down. Sponsorships, I mean, a lot of counties found it very difficult to get sponsors this year, for instance. While this debate rages at national level, for many clubs like St. Lazarians, there are more pressing, practical issues threatening their very existence. We're a relatively small club and there's, whatever, fundraising aside and money aside, it's immigration and migration are the two biggest issues within the club. We won the Intermediate Championship back in 2007, I think it was, and I'd say we've lost about 11 or 12 lads off that team. Of the adult hurlers we have here today, there's probably 25 or 6 of the boys out training, and I'd say the guts of 8 or 10 are probably commuting from Dublin um, every day. So it's a massive issue. Like For a small club like us and all the small clubs around the country, there's only so much that they're going to sustain. They can't, they can't keep it up. The Kerry County Board recently commissioned a report into rural depopulation due to unemployment and immigration. Its findings are worrying for a sport that has traditionally thrived in small rural communities.
In 1998, 69% of clubs in the county were able to field 15-a-side teams at minor level. Last year, just 37% of clubs were in that position. That's just the reality of our times, I suppose. And, you know, that maybe the only solution to that, perhaps, is clubs to amalgamate, which uh, is a very difficult thing for, for clubs to do. But I suppose we've had that before, go back to the 50s and the 70s or whatever, and uh, GA clubs, they are remarkably resilient, though. That's, that's what you always find. Indeed, any sporting organisation that can attract 45,000 paying customers to a league opener on a wintry Saturday night looks on the face of it to be in rude good health. You have this modern organisation with all the trappings of professionalism, huge crowd, television money, corporate boxes, the best stadium uh, in the country. But this issue of money, this issue of money and the relationship between professionalism, amateurism and volunteerism, and how that is wrapped around the structures of the GEA has the capacity to create an enormous problem for the GEA and it's not easy to see how it can be managed.